Faint crackling and rumbling can be heard above the dense canopy. Clouds, dark and brooding, spiral up high into the atmosphere. The wide sun looms large. Lines of sunlight break through into the forest, but the scene remains glum, as if sketched in charcoal, colour sucked from the place. The witch woman moves slowly, she hobbles like an ape, using three or four appendages at a time. Undead surround her, running to and fro, fighting, howling, scratching like dogs. They are her pack. They move with her, as one, trotting at her heels. Which woman's fingers reach out to a tree branch? It crumbles in her grip. She slips, grabbing at some leafy plant of yellow-green. It turns to grey and white, the colour sapping away. Her little accident doesn't slow the pack. She moves on. The undead start to hoot, their bodies becoming rigid. They take up an attacking stance. The calls draw the attention of the woman. Before her, the forest meets the river basin, the flood plain that feeds her land with its fine soil, the only flat area in their dominion. A meadow of tall, untouched grass, littered with wiry old trees and baked rocks. The wind plays with the terrain, making waves on the vast green ocean. Sunlight hits the witch's eyes, pupils shrink, Red irises eclipse the darkened discs. She blinks slowly and raises her arm. Her bloodied hands point at the plain, forcing the undead to move away. Soon the pasture is covered with their mangled bodies. They call out to each other, communicating with hoots and howls. Which woman walks into the tall grass too? She brushes away the long green strands leaving red stains on the pristine flora. Losing view of her pack, she barks out a command. The undead call back. Those demons helping her, guiding her through the grass. She parts a curtain of the stuff and discovers the asteroid's crater. Her subjects line up. They pace about, looking down into the hole, excited by the strange scene. Feet and hands churn up the soil, adding more dust to the haze of the day. From the crater, a shower of stone and earth erupts. The undead scatter, running in all directions. A huge roar shakes the land, akin to a whale song but far more intense. The bellow stops, then a rhythmic clicking, like some hellish woodblock ripples through the air like electric jumping a wire. The undead return, they stare down into the hole, searching for viable prey. Which woman approaches, a path opens for her, the demons part to allow her through their ranks. She walks by, making them cower and bow in submission, averting their eyes. She steps from the crowd, up onto the pile of earth that circles the crater. The hole is vast. It stretches out in a perfect circle of destruction. Inside it, the walls are steep, like cliff faces. At their base, the earth curves and becomes a flat area. The hole is indeed vast, yet the object it contains is equally as impressive. The thing from the sky resting smoking at its center. Reddish orange in hue, textured like baked clay, the meteor is shaped in a familiar manner, a human-like form, with arms crossed over its chest, its features printed into the stone. The old woman doesn't know, but the thing looks exactly like a sarcophagus, without the embellishments. She pays it little attention, until the thing shakes and begins to crack. 
something breaking out from within, like some adolescent creature emerging from the egg. Solid rock cracks and falls away, a being moves in the rubble, a great arm-like extension projects from the form, forcing its frame up from the ground. Wide legs appear at its base, growing in seconds into powerful pillars. Another huge arm springs from its midsection. The beast is shaped like many animals, but its like has never been seen on earth. The skin is solid and liquid at once, changing its shape to best suit its terrain. No familiar orifices can be seen, it's smooth all over. No eye, no ear, leg and arm created and destroyed as needed. Its appendages reach into the air, then crash into the hole. Huge piles of stone are excavated and thrown out behind the beast, earth shifted in tons. Witch woman steps to the edge and hops into the hole. She lurches down the newly turned soil as the stone giant buries its arms in the ground again. She yells out a command. Ravaged lungs spit specks of blood into the air. Some lands about her cheeks and lips. Demon, face your master! The woman screeches. Her eyes grow wide as the beast turns its attention on the tiny woman. She stretches her arms out, like a child yearning for its mother's embrace. The skies have gifted me. Take me up with you, my fine friend. She speaks to the beast in a loud tone. The stone form stands over her. It blocks the sun from view. Which woman speaks, and the creature's front starts to crack revealing a darker colored stone, coal black. The clayish flesh of the beast recedes further, another form fills the clay. The black stone shimmers within, it moves. Liquid clay reveals an abdomen and neck, then a large skull. Within it, large yellow eyes open slowly peering at the old woman. Below them a wide jaw hangs. Fleshy, dark tissue attaches the beast's exoskeleton to the outer stone shell. This dark beast inhabits the inside of the stone entity, making its nest there. Which woman, with arms still outstretched, shouts again, Take me up with you! The stone form shakes violently, then more light than the woman has ever experienced explodes in front of her eyes, like a star going supernova. Arms drop, body twists, then her feet lift from the earth. In the background her subordinates, the undead, cry out. They whine and hoot, their calls getting louder, more savage as the body of the woman floats higher into the dust-ridden air. The dark beast's eyes are fixed on the woman. They flash red, and the woman falls. Light disappears. The body drops from the air, into the soil. The creature retreats back into its outer shell. When the stone has covered the dark beast, an arm-like appendage rushes out from the body. It lingers over the woman, resting a few meters above her head. Which woman tries to move? Her arms can't support even the tiny amount of weight that she retains. The woman rolls over on her side. Dirt covers her face. Then she disappears under the limb of the beast. A hand like a boulder, an arm like an obelisk colored like baked clay. It drops onto her, smashing the elder into the softened soil. Its palm meets the ground. Dirt rushes out from under it, 
spiralling in complex waves. The undead turn to silence. Calls cease. The things look lost. They stare at the place where their master had been, frozen without leadership. The huge stone beast lifts its hand and turns back to its toil. Arms reform, growing instantly from the outer shell's surface. It starts to dig. Earth and stone fly out behind it, landing on the area on which the woman lies. Heavy boots trudge along a slim path, the silence of the forest sullied by the beat of their feet. The soldiers sweat profusely, huge packs of equipment hug their backs. Behind them they pull a blue plastic sheet. On this sheet, their injured comrade recuperates. They don't talk, the men cough and wheeze, but no words leave their mouths. Anguish and fatigue is evident on their faces. Of the two standing men, one is taller, more robust. The other is wiry and muscular. They pull on the blue sheet together, one at each corner. Wiry man calls a halt. He drops the makeshift gurney and jogs along the path to a clearing. The larger man falls to his knees. He draws breath in deep gasps, chest rising and falling like bellows. It's close now, about 700 meters I'd say. No movement, no sound. We'll have to cover in the forest, but we have to make it across the car park so there's no real protection. I can run there. Stop. Stop, sit down for two minutes. Please, you're making me feel so old. Captain looks at his man. He hadn't done so before. Now he sees the bruising, the cuts on his face, the desperate look in his eyes. You should have treated those. These places have the craziest diseases floating around. You'll end up shitting yourself to death or something. Captain laughs the chuckle trying to cover up his inner turmoil. The soldier isn't so jovial. He stands with his hands on his hips, waiting for a command. Captain changes his tactics. Take a second to gather your strength. Get some water in you. You have to hydrate, Marcello. Then we'll approach along the tree line. I want to get him to the medical center. First priority. Then we can secure the computer lab and find the, uh, the, uh, can you work out the computer stuff? They want some CPU or something. Yes, that's fine. The wiry man pulls forth a metal tankard and empties it into his mouth. On the plastic sheet, the man groans. He gestures to his comrades. He needs water. Marcello digs into his pack, then throws him a plastic bottle, half full of water. Get up, son. I'm sorry, but we've got to move fast. But don't worry, because you'll be in a nice, comfy bed in a few minutes, you lucky bastard. So get ready, and we'll leave. Captain gathers himself up off the ground. A hand goes out to the injured man. Soon he hangs between his comrades arms intertwined with theirs. They walk him down through the foliage, grunting and swearing as they go. The mining complex is built from concrete, with an iron roof. Around it a tall chain-link fence keeps the forest at bay. Buildings rise up out of the earth like cement cliffs. Some are still bright white, their paint untouched by the fire. The gleaming windows sparkle, visible from miles away. The rest of the place is either browned through years of gathering filth, or blackened and burnt into oblivion by the fire. The place stands out as the only piece of civilization for hundreds of miles. It hides amongst the trees and vines, like a forgotten temple of some long-lost people. The soldiers approach it quickly, and with little reverence.
Rip that fucker open. Captain points at the fence. Marcello leaves him to support the stricken man and pulls the bottom of the fence up to knee height. Captain helps the injured soldier under it. Then he follows. Finally he lifts the fence for Marcello. The last soldier dips under and returns to the other two, propping up the injured man. Well done, Gerard. We'll make it through this yet. Captain laughs again. The men carry on toward the complex. They fail to find words to suit the situation. Across the car park with the bodies of the mining company men, and into the atrium, into the shade of the welcome centre. They loose their equipment and proceed along the corridors to the first aid office. Gerard is left on a cot. Then the other two make for the computer lab. You get in there and secure the CPU. I'm calling in. Meet back at the entrance. Captain takes his leave. He walks down a clean, cool corridor. Then down the charred remains of another. With all sorts of stains covering the walls. His clothes have been ravaged. Face muddied. In the atrium he pulls his pack over to a comfortable looking sofa. An audible groan of relief can be heard, along with the cracking of knee joints. Captain takes the radio from his pack. He speaks. Valkyrie base, Valkyrie base, do you receive? Valkyrie base, Valkyrie bit, Valkyrie base receives. Authentication. Barely audible words emit from the radio. A high-pitched whine and an undulating bass note help to make the voice near indecipherable. Authentication. Papa Lima Alpha uh, November Echo Tango 3. Roger, we have you, Captain Ike. What is your sit rep? We're at RV point S1. Request immediate exfil. Has the CPU been recovered, Captain? Affirmative. Rescue Halo is en route. ETA, 37 minutes. Thank you, Valkyrie Base. I thought you had it in for me for a while there. Right. Well, uh, Ike out. Valkyrie Base out. Captain leans back on the sofa. He closes his eyes. He can only relax for a second before. Sir. What's up? I found something. I think you should see it. Captain sighs. In the darkened computer lab, the twinkling lights and flickering screens of the machines shine out. Behind the rows of workstations, a brightly lit office with glass partition holds the two soldiers. Captain leans over his comrade's shoulder. He seems perplexed. What is it? It's a map of the local area, showing... I know that. What's the meaning of this colored area? Why did you make me walk all the way up here in the first place? Right, right. Well, these are the areas that have been mined. These are the areas where they have sunk bores in order to check the mineral content. And this area here is the land that they're not supposed to mine. The tribal land. But as you can see, there are a few mines there too. Basically, the mining company has been digging illegally. The soldier looks up at his commanding officer. Bastards. Captain grunts. Sir? All this shit. We were sent here to cover up. Just to protect some fucking mining company. Bastards. Right. Where's the gold, or whatever it is that they mined? I'm getting something out of this, I tell you. Well, I don't know. That's actually a good question. What is it that they are mining? Place looks more like a uh, research center than a mine. I haven't seen any trucks full of coal, or anything really. Just lots of computers and laboratories. Plus, there's this. Marcello hands the captain a green medical folder. 
at least 15 people have suffered from radiation poisoning. Or at least that's what it looks like. The doctors here didn't have a clue. They had the same symptoms as radiation poisoning, but according to this, none of them had been in contact with anything radioactive. Vomiting, bleeding eyes, and eventually death. I thought the lack of trucks and mining equipment was weird. Now this shit. But that isn't why I got you here. There's these satellite pictures of the whole place. Crazy detail. With heat maps and um, infrared. All sorts. So they can find the minerals, you know? Now I want you to look at this section. There's something down there. Something huge. Like a town or a city. The mad thing is I reckon it's made from gold or silver. But it's shaped strangely. Let's see it. Show me. I love this archaeological stuff. Indiana Jones and all that. I gotta watch that again when we get back. Here it is. Look. Wow. That is massive, isn't it? Yeah, that is big. Doesn't look like a city, though. Maybe a temple? Or a castle? Must have wasted away over time. Got buried by the earth. This part is almost intact, look. But over here it's just scattered remains. The strange shape lingers on the screen. Both men tilt their heads as they look at it. Should they copy it, sir? The young soldier asks. Do it. Do it quickly. The halo's on its way. Deafening engine noise fills the interior of the helicopter. Along the walls sit more soldiers, five on each side. The heads are down, weapons readied. Across the intercom, a message is heard. ETA four minutes, weapons authorized, ready your men. Affirmative. Team, mount up. The men jump up at once. Black armor strapped over their vital parts. They turn to the man on their right and pat him down, checking equipment. Then they shout out their number and an affirmative to the commander. I want this done quick and clean, gentlemen. We are not a home to Mr. Fuck Up. Always fat wife, Mrs. Cock Up. In and out. Do you get me? We, we get, get you, sir. sir. I say not one mistake. No clowning. No grab ass. And no showboating. The commander shouts into the face of the nearest man, spit and sweat bursting off his face onto the unsuspecting soldier. Do you get me? We, we get, get you, sir. sir. Not far below, the forest hums with the sound of helicopter rotors at full speed, vicious blades cutting out furious circles in the sky. Further down again, in the deep jungle, under the cover of the canopy, the sound is baffled and strange. It twists and contorts until it resembles no human device. Yet the animal ear is attuned to such things. They react. Birds leap from their perches. Small mammals scurry into their sets. And the undead look up from their toil. The hunters stop chasing and stare up at the noise. The gatherers drop their beaten prey and sniff the air. The watchers hoot and wail. The call is taken up by all. Undead saturate the area. A multitude of rotting carcasses. They turn and begin to hunt the noise in the sky. The jungle resonates with their war cry. In the atrium, Three tired men stand and wait. Captain helps the wounded man stay vertical. His leg has been cleaned and bandaged. The young soldier, Marcello, carries all three packs. One on his back, one in each hand. Here it is, Gerard. You ready? Yes, sir. The helicopter skims across the treetops. Engines roar. Its black body swings over them. Banking hard. Salvation hovers fifty feet over their heads. 
For them the final leg of the journey is at hand. They shuffle out through the glass doors, past the wrecked cars, the draft of the helicopter rushing over them. At the centre of the car park it touches down, doors open, and ten soldiers, adorned in black, jump onto the asphalt. High-powered rifles rise to aim at the captain's men. One of these soldiers breaks formation and approaches. Captain Ike! The man clad in black yells. Uh, yeah. The captain yells back. Do you have the package? Sure, sure. Let's go. Captain starts to walk towards the helicopter. The man stops him with his rifle's barrel. Captain swats it away. What the fuck are you doing? You're here to rescue us. Get the hell out of my way. Give me the package, then you get your rescue. Fuck off. Captain makes for the halo. The rifle explodes next to him. Or so he thought. Even in the hectic noise of the helicopter, the burst of fire was excessively loud. He feels Gerard jerk away from him, then go limp. He looks over to see his comrade's face has been shot away down the right side. From the nose across is a mess of gnarled flesh and bone. It pulses with blood. The wounds seem to flex and contort. The man is still alive. Basic brain function gone, left with only the reflexes of a dying body, and the pain. Captain falls to the ground. The body drops with him. He rolls away from this wreckage of a man, finding his feet is difficult. The shock makes him sickly and weak. On standing, the blackened soldier cracks him on the temple with his gun. Behind them, the youngster relieves himself of the packs and shoves his hands high in the air. The black commander drags Captain Ike up onto his knees. The package! In the bags! Captain shouts. Black commander looks at the young soldier. He gestures for him to come forwards. Marcello lowers his hands. I'll get it! He yells. The packs are flung open and he goes about his search. Black commander's rifle is trained on the boy. Young minds move quickly. From the bag he pulls a pistol and hides it amongst the growing pile of equipment. An endless supply of soldiers' wares flow out of the pack, but not the CPU. Come on! Black Commander screams. Sorry, wrong one, it's in here! Behind this scene, the chain-link fence that circles the complex ruptures. It falls under the weight of the climbing undead. They spot their prey instantly and start to pace like panthers, slowly creeping through the cars in the lot, watching the giant hovering beast all the while. At the edge of the car park they stop, eyes fixed. They see the blackened soldier send another crashing blow into the temple of the captain. Marcello, the youngster, sees this attack and cringes. He pulls a metal box with some wires hanging from it out of the bag and presents it to the commander. Take it! Take it! Black commander steps over the captain towards the youngster, who greets him with a smile. Commander leans out to take the package. Marcello lowers his hand slightly, drawing the commander in. Then he brings his other hand around from his side. Commander spots it. The boy has armed himself. Captain Ike rolls over to view the exchange, expecting the interloper to harm his last friend. He's shocked to see two holes burst from the commander's back. Blood and minced organs rain onto the tarmac. The captain hears a voice over the whining of the helicopter. Take this! The young soldier screams in the commander's face as he pulls the trigger. Now his face is only white. Only a few dashes of blood have landed on him. And as the body falls away, the gun is held aloft, aimed at the black soldiers. 
In milliseconds the boy is gone. Marcello is torn to pieces. His face takes two bullets then collapses in on itself. Arms reach up in defense. His shoulders shake like a rattler's tail. Holes appear in his chest and neck. Then the body falls backwards. No longer supported by life's vigor. Still bullets hammer into the carcass. Spraying red mist and tarmac over the unpacked bags. Within the halo the pilot is checking his instruments. When the bullets start to fly he looks out the window. Only for a handful of seconds before turning away in disgust. No one could enjoy the sight of a young man being destroyed with such casual glee. Glad I'm just a pilot. Lord thank you. He mumbles. To his left he sees movement. Something runs past. Like a shadow in the corner of his eye. A mass of creatures have appeared. They move as one towards him and his affiliates. He shudders as his vision of the beasts becomes clear. His mind reels. Through the glass he can make out their missing body parts. The blotches on their skin like savage bruises. The partially rotted flesh hanging off of broken bones. At least thirty of the predators lurch forwards and attack. The engines roar and the helicopter lifts off, swaying wildly, banking to the left. Its tail sweeps in a wide semicircle past the blackened soldiers, missing their heads by a few feet. The black-clad men spin around to see the halo sail away. Then the undead are on them, biting, clawing, pulling at any soft flesh not covered by armor howling with joy and screaming with the ecstasy of the kill. The troops fall. Some fire madly into the crowd of beasts. Bullets don't stop the wave of rabid exhumans. Much aggression and mindless rage fills the ranks of these undead. Bursts of fire erupt from rifles. A line of hot flying metal tears up a chunk of the car park then rips across the back of a soldier. The man fighting off the undead effectively until he is hosed down with lead. He drops. They engulf him. A large undead pounces onto the next trooper, the jaws locking onto his nose and mouth. The soldier tries his hardest to push the thing away. He cannot. His balaclava tears away with flesh inside. Two more undead descend on him. They smother his neck and shoulders in bites. The man begins to shake, his body going into convulsions. Captain, with only one thing in mind, crawls across the asphalt. His head is split open on the right side. Blood pools around him. On arm and knee, he moves over the car park, away from the carnage behind him. He doesn't stop to look at his comrades' bodies. No time for prayer or pleasant words. Only pain and regret can be found in his mind. The last trooper goes limp. He gives up the battle as an undead lands another huge blow on his face. The man's skull bounces off the tarmac. The predators hoot and howl, victorious. But they notice something. Movement. The movement of a wounded animal. An easy target. The captain's slow moving body is in their sight, worming its way to the building. They leap after him. The sound and vibration of thirty running feet prepares the captain. He feels them coming. He knows they're close. With the last dram of energy, he rises. The man stumbles through the atrium's glass doors. He makes for the nearest office, checking the door for a lock, then slamming it shut. The lock is turned and engaged. Captain slumps down, pushing his back up against the door for added strength. In the corridor, the undead gamble and play, enlivened, so to speak, by the hunt. 
they sniff at the area. Some move through the offices. After a few minutes without sight of their prey, they are satiated. The pack leave, filing out through the atrium's glass doors, singing their deathly song all the while. The captain sits, his body trembles, arms wrapped around his chest. When he can hear no more of the undead, he departs, making his way slowly out of the building, checking for danger as he goes. There was no sign of them, only a lingering odour. He reaches the car park, bodies lie everywhere. He stands over the waist of the black troopers. Fuckers. He grumbles. He grumbles. The man spits on them, gaining some tiny measure of vengeance. He takes a rifle, checks it for ammo. After more searching, he sees a pack of cigarettes poking out of a trooper's chest pocket. The pack is wet through. Blood drips from the cellophane wrapper, but they are still smokable. Captain lights one. He exhales a huge plume of smoke. Then, with a grunt of pain, he slumps to the floor. <laughs>